Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, I ask you now, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life? And will you include your fellow Christians in your care? And that question comes to us in our service of holy baptism. And just as today, Palm Sunday is the last Sunday of Lent, so that's the last question that we answer together before anyone is baptized or we renew our baptism. And as I'm sure you might be getting tired of hearing by now, in the, in the early church, the 40 days before Easter, that, that, that started as a tradition, as a time to prepare people for baptism and as a time to learn and to teach and, and to be trained in what it means to live as a Christian. And so that's why we've been using this season of Lent as a time to remind ourselves of, of, of the vows that either we made or were made for us at our baptism. And to that question about whether you will nurture uh, and support one another in living the Christian life, uh, this is the answer that our faith teaches us to give. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround one another with a community of love and forgiveness that we may grow in our trust of God and be found faithful in our service to others. We will pray for each other that we may be true disciples of Jesus who walk in the way that leads to life. So this is a good time and a good season to ask ourselves, how are we doing with all of that? Are we surrounding one another with a community of love and forgiveness so that each one of us can grow in our trust of God and be found faithful in, in serving others? And are we praying for each other? Are we praying that each one of us might be a true disciple of Jesus who walks in the way that leads to life? And honestly, whether we're doing a good job at that or not, or whether we see things that, that way, there is some comfort in knowing that the bar for, for being a disciple was set pretty low by the very first disciples we read about this morning, and specifically the disciples named Peter, James, and John. And actually, when it comes to surrounding one another with a community of love and, and prayer and forgiveness, that's exactly what Peter, James, and John failed to do here and in the most egregious way possible. And that's because they fail to provide Jesus Christ himself with a community of support at the very moment when he needed his friends the most. So after all, this was the night when Jesus was betrayed into the hands of sinners. The evening before, he would be uh, stripped, whipped, and hung on a cross to die. And on that night, all Jesus wanted was for his friends to, to remain awake with him, to stay up with him, and to pray. But Peter, James, and John, they could not do it. It says that they fell fast asleep. Now, I have to admit that a line that resonates with me from our passage from Mark this morning is when Jesus asks his disciples, could you not keep awake one hour? And that line is standing out to me, but not for any spiritual reason. It's because I have a two-week-old baby in the house right now. And so uh, I can sympathize with the disciples they just wanted to get a little bit of shut eye here that night. Uh, they, it, it, and I worried by the end of the service today, you'd be saying to me, Pastor Matt, could you not keep awake for one hour? <laughs> but at least I do have the excuse of having a, a newborn baby in the house. I don't know about you, but when I read this passage, when I read about Peter, James, and John falling asleep on the, 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 this fateful night. I wonder, you know, what's the problem with these guys? How could they not keep awake on the night when, when our Lord so badly needed them? He needed their prayers, needed their support. And my suspicion is that the reason they were so tired, so despondent that night is because this was a week when things did not turn out at all as they had planned. 
So let's go back just for a moment to Mark 11, the passage we've already talked about, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's the passage we typically focus on on, on Palm Sunday, and it is a, a glorious passage. Jesus riding on the donkey into the holy city, surrounded by the joyous cries of his followers. And we do see Jesus here fulfilling the words of Zechariah. In Zechariah 9 in the Old Testament, he prophesies, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. So in other words, when Jesus sets this scene up, when he's riding into Jerusalem with the palm branches all around, he knew what he was doing and how it would be seen. He was revealing himself as Israel's true king and Messiah here. And if it were the Jesus of Palm Sunday who asked his disciples to stay awake with him, I bet they would have been happy to oblige him on that. Because who wouldn't want to do the bidding of such a, a good and, and mighty and gracious king? The problem, though, is that as that week wore on, Jesus wasn't acting like a king. He certainly wasn't talking like a king. Instead, he was preaching about his own death. He was talking about a cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, as, as an old hymn says. And needless to say, that wasn't what the disciples wanted to hear. The king they were looking for wasn't going to die a humiliating death, the death in that culture of, of a no-account slave or a traitor to his country. It was no wonder they, they fell asleep in, in sheer exha exhaustion. They were hoping they could go to sleep and then wake up and all this talk about crosses and death would turn out to be a bad dream. And friends, I wonder if we truly appreciate what's going on in this scene. Because after all, you and I, we're used to, to thinking of Jesus as the almighty king, the, the one we pray to, the one we worship as our savior and our Lord, but our faith also tells us that he was human. Every bit as human as you and me. And nowhere is that more clear than in this scene of the Garden of Gethsemane where we see a, a lonely, frightened man falling on his knees in prayer. Here we see Jesus practically begging his friends to stay with him, to pray for him. Because when he thinks of what's coming, when he, and he knows what's coming, he doesn't know at this time if he has the strength even to endure it. For us, it's almost embarrassing to see Jesus Christ in a state like this. So that's why we don't want to be too quick to judge those disciples for failing to keep awake with Jesus that night. Would we have done any better? Those disciples, they had no trouble seeing Jesus as an almighty king. But what they weren't prepared for was to see their Lord as dependent and weak. Someone who needed them to pray for him. Think about that. So I don't know about you, but when I read or this scene, it gives, a, it gives a new perspective on that vow I talked about. The vow from our baptisms where we promise that, that we're going to pray for each other. We're going to provide each other a community of love and support. Because even our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was among us, needed the support of a community of his friends. He needed them. He depended on his friends at the end. Well, that's a challenge to this idea we're raised with of, of individualism, this idea that we're each responsible for, for pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It would be hard to think of a concept that's more foreign to the Bible and to the life of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite Christians of the last century, the 20th century, was a woman named Dorothy Day. And she was somebody who was famous for working with the poor, for starting houses of hospitality all over the country where, where the poor would be welcome, where they would be received as brothers and sisters, treated as equals. I know they're talking about making Dorothy Day a saint in the Catholic Church, uh, even right now. But long before Dorothy Day was a Catholic or before she was even a Christian, she lived a very radical lifestyle, the lifestyle of a, of, a, of a bohemian and a committed communist. 
She was a communist and a secularist, uh, but one of the, the turning points that pushed her towards God, towards her calling in life, it was a moment when the sheer loneliness of, of, of secular American life was, was brought home to her. And in her autobiography, Dorothy Day describes a time when, as a young woman, she got very sick. She was living then in this large apartment building in New York City, and it was a building filled to the brim with people. But even there were, though there were so many people in close proximity to her, her illness left her by herself in a single room of that apartment. And she thought then about how many people were around her in that building. But each person holding on to a desire for privacy and, and for going his own way. And Day writes, I shall never forget that siege of illness in a rooming house where each one of us was isolated from the other, each afraid another would ask something from him. And she realized that's not how God created us to live. And that's no wonder because God is love. God's actually the perfect love of between three persons we call the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God made us for love. Even more, God made the church to be a people who bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, which is the words of, of St. Paul in Galatians. So how telling it is that even God's son, when he was among us, he longed for his friends to stay beside him so he wouldn't have to bear his burden alone. But as we all know, Peter, James, and John couldn't do it. They failed to carry that burden with Jesus Christ that night. They slept when Jesus needed them the most, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It was hard to, to see their beloved teacher suffering. So they just took the easy path of snoozing through the night, pretending none of it was happening. But can we really judge them? Is it not just as hard for us to be with people who are suffering? If you're constantly with people who are sick, people who are grieving, people who are poor or addicted, doesn't that drain your energy? Wouldn't you too just rather sleep? Because to see somebody else in need, it reminds us of our own vulnerability. It reminds us of there but for the grace of of God go I. So no wonder we'd rather put our blinders on and doze and sleep, sleep it off. And lately, uh, I and others who attended uh, seminary at Duke Divinity School in North Carolina, have been, we've been following the story of one of the professors there whose name is Kate Bowler. And in her mid-30s, she's one of the youngest professors at Duke, probably the whole university, and by all accounts I've heard of her, I never had her myself, but she's a great scholar and Christian. Within the last two years, at the age of 35, Kate Bowler, this professor at Duke, she was diagnosed with an untreatable form of stage four colon cancer, something that's never going to go away. And what made this diagnosis especially hard for her is when she, she's, a, she's a young wife, a mother of a two-year-old son. And in a, in a short amount of time, her whole world has been turned upside down. And she's actually written a short book that I uh, just purchased about her experience over this past year. And it's called, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. So as that title would suggest, uh, she, in that book, she's challenging a lot of the easy answers, the easy, uh, the, the, the cliches we, we people of faith sometimes turn to when, when, when people we love are suffering. And just a couple weeks ago, I heard Kate Bowler, uh, the professor from Duke, I heard her being interviewed on NPR about her cancer. And it was a very powerful witness to the Christian faith because she said that even though she would not wish her cancer on anyone, she actually has seen God bring some good out of it. She said, well, for one thing, she's noticed that she is now more attuned to the people that God brings into her life. 
And she said her experience with, with sickness was, quote, like this secret key that opened up a whole new reality. And part of that reality was the realization that your own pain connects you to the pain of other people. And all of a sudden, I realized how incredibly fragile life is for almost everyone. And then I noticed things. It's like you notice the tired mom in the grocery store who's just struggling to get the thing off the top shelf while her kid screams. And you notice how very tired that person looks at the bus stop. And then, of course, all the people in the cancer clinic around me. I felt like I was cracked open and I could see everything really clearly for the very first time. And so in this season of Lent, when I heard Professor Bowler talking about how her pain, her sickness, connected her to others, how could I not think about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Because Jesus put on my flesh and blood so that he could take my pain onto himself. As we see Jesus agonizing there in the garden, we know that there is no human pain that is foreign to him, no pain that he does not understand. So badly did he want to connect to you and to me that he shares our weakness, even the weakness of those disciples who failed him so badly and couldn't keep awake with him through the night. And once you've realized that truth, once you've seen him there in the garden and realized he was agonizing for you, for your sake, what more is there to say than the words of Charles Wesley? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my king, shouldst die for me? So if you're struggling, if you're struggling to, to connect with others, or if you're finding it hard to show mercy, show mercy to someone who is sick, someone who is needy, someone who needs your presence, even though it's a drain, even though it's difficult, well, look to Jesus and keep your eyes on him this holy week. See him in the garden struggling with that burden that only he could carry. Look to him as he climbs Calvary's mountain, bearing not, not just the weight of an old rugged cross, but bearing the weight and the burden of your sin and of mine. Behold our king dying a poor man's death, forsaken by his friends and forsaken even by his father in heaven, so that you and I might never be forsaken. So this Holy Week, let us surround and pray for one another. That together we might take up our crosses and follow him on the way that leads to life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.